Welcome to Lean AppSec Fall Edition, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This entire event is about risk prioritization and essentially when we have a small application security team helping a large group of developers prioritize the security risks that they actually need to be spending their time on, how do we do it? So we've had sessions about the people and process and metrics side of the things, and we also need to understand okay, now we have all of our metrics, we have all of this data, and we have our EPSS and SSVC and, and CVSS, and there's a bunch of other acronyms that we can name and sound very smart. What do we actually do with them? So we've asked Darren Mayer, who's making his second Lean AppSec appearance here with us, to join Stephen from Peloton as well. We also have our resident CISO, Mia, with, with Stephen here. And we're going to be talking about what do we do with all this data. So Stephen, can you kick us off by just introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about what you do in your day-to-day -day job at uh, Peloton? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so hey, everyone, Stephen Schaefer here. Uh, I am a staff security automation engineer at Peloton. And recently, I've been focusing on uh, revamping our vulnerability management program. Uh, and so day-to-day, -day, really what I'm doing is building out pipelines for our vulnerability data to do exactly what we're going to be talking about, uh, prioritizing it and, and building thresholds and analyzing data, as well as writing automations to address these things, right? Like how do we address these things at scale, stuff like that, and all the conversations and fun things that go with that. Yeah. That's... And do you report into an engineering org or into a dedicated security org? So I report into actually the legal org at Peloton, and, but underneath legal is our security team. And, and so I report up into engineering with the security. Okay. I'm not, I'm going to try not to derail our session with questions yeah. about that. Questions I, about that. I, I find that <laughs> fascinating. Darren, can you uh, quickly introduce yourself as well? Sure. So I'm Darren Meyer. I'm the lead solution architect uh, with Ender Labs. I came from a practitioner and research background. So I've spent much more time building programs, advising people on building programs, doing R&D for security products, things like that in my life. And with Endor, I'm helping customers do that for the kind of general software security use cases that we support. Amazing. So I figured a good place for us to start is by just understanding the acronym SOUP, right? Understanding all of the different prioritization methods. So. We're not going to be using slides for most of this conversation, but we did just want to briefly talk about all of all of these things, right? So we hear about these things a lot, CVSS, SSVC, EPSS, Kev, all of, all of these things. Darren, can I kick it over to you just to help us try to begin to understand where all of these things sit, what are they good at, what are they not good at? Maybe we can start with, I think the most common one is probably CVSS, the one that, that everybody knows. So maybe we can start there. Sure, yeah, CVSS was built in and is maintained by an organization called FIRST as a way to say, we're getting all these vulnerability reports, we need to know how bad they are. And it's gone through several evolutions of this. And the idea is to, to get an impact analysis, right? G given this particular vulnerability in this particular software package, how bad is this for? It tries to take into consideration a degree of environmental data and a, and a degree of what they call temporal data, which is like, as things are right now, how bad is this? If someone were to exploit this, how bad would things be? Uh, it struggles a little bit because it's very opinionated. It, it relies on researchers and others who are reporting the, the vulnerabilities to use it correctly, for one, but also there's just a lot of subjectivity in, in the scoring system. So you're essentially filling out a, a scorecard to figure out how much does this impact confidentiality, how much does it impact integrity, and so on, and it generates a score for you. And, and where it falls down and it gets difficult to use is one, it's only impact, right? You, you don't have a likelihood component to trying to prioritize with it. So you're just saying like, how bad could it be? And not really considering how likely is it that I'm going to be impacted by it. But also the reporter of the CVE makes a big difference into how severe it's going to be evaluated as. But if you have a security researcher who's external, who's maybe submitting this as part of a bug bounty or whatever the case may be, in their own best interest to go, this is really bad because their reputation kind of hinges on, I found a bunch of really bad things, right? So they're going to have a natural bias to, this is bad and it's really important. And if it's somebody reporting a flaw in their own product, of course, there's going to be a natural tendency to be like, oh, it's not that bad. 
And there's a lot of opportunity to do that, even when you're not being unethical about it, to just have that bias impact you. So, so it's, it's a useful tool, but you got to understand the limits and the biases that come with it. And that, that same org first kind of saw some of these problems with CVSS, especially the whole, hey, we don't have a, a good likelihood dimension here. And so they came up with EPSS to use as a, as a companion to CVSS. And it's their attempt to say, I can't tell you how likely it is in your particular organization and your particular application that this thing will be exploited. But I can tell you in general, using a bunch of signals for a given CVE entry, like how exploitable is this right now? And they take things like, are there, is there known exploit code? Have people reported exploits? Is there a proof of concept? Is this widely deployed? Is this component deployed in a way that's typically accessible on the internet or not? Those kinds of things. There's, a, there's about 37 different signals I think they process. I might be off on that number. Uh, but they try to get a, a, a kind of a probability. And then they also look at the set as a whole and say, is this more or less likely than other CDEs? So you get a percentage and a percentile out of it. And that really helps because you can look at my organization and I can go, I'm going to fix all the criticals and highs in CVS. Anything that's the CVS S score above, say, six, I can say, I want to fix all of those things. But do I really, right? I have a limited amount of time and effort. If I use EPSS2, I can say, okay, I'm going to exclude things from that list that have a less than 5% chance of exploit in the next 30 days, which is what EPSS is trying to say. In the next 30 days, how likely is this to be exploited? And I'm going to say, I'm not going to say I never have to worry about those things, but I'm not going to do them right away because I don't have the resources. So using those two things together gets you that impact and likelihood, but it doesn't tell you about those things in your org, just generally across the world. So with EPSS, the whole concept of will this be exploited in the next 30 days? Is that something that generally we, we base off of, was it exploited in the past? Like what are we using in order to make that assumption? Yeah. So first there's a bunch of signals. I don't remember them all off the top of my head that, that go into this, but it is things like, is there a well-known proof of concept code? Is there something like a Metasploit module for this? Like how easy is it for an attacker to exploit this? And things that have just, it's a report, there's a CVE entry, but there's no chatter about it on the internet. No one's really talking about it. Nobody has disclosed that they've been breached. Nobody has, it's not being seen in the wild by the people who are reporting to them. And there's not like proof of concept code. It's going to score a lot lower. As those things become less true over time, if something becomes more exploited or more exploitable, they'll try to do it. But it is an estimate based on, on signals, right? It is not something like KEV, which tells you this has actually been truly exploited and here's when. It's we think based on what we're seeing that this is probable or improbable. Yeah. And Stephen, okay. can you talk maybe a little bit about SVC and, and how that fits into this soup? Yeah, sure. So just one note on EPSS. So it is a machine learning model. And so it, it does measure itself. And so the, it does improve over time based on, after various iterations. So there is some level of, hey, we're validating that this is predicting actual exploits in the wild. And as newer models come out, you can look at the white papers and actually see how efficient and how much coverage that these models get. And there's been a huge jump in version two to version three. And version three just came out this year, I think in March or May. So it's relatively recent and it's relatively recently more accurate is what I'll say. Jumping it back over into SSVC, like EPSS and CVSS are, are great, right? SSVC is how do you put these things together to make decisions on what to prioritize? And uh, so SSVC is stakeholder specific vulnerability categorization. And the stakeholder part uh, comes from various stakeholders within the vulnerability uh, process. Uh, that can be uh, folks who are um, reporting vulnerabilities to the companies. They, they can be people who are, are uh, issuing patches. They can also be people like myself who are practitioners within organizations uh, to determine what I should be patching based off the signals that I'm getting, right? And so there's, there's a base model that sort of comes out with the white paper as well as within uh, CISA. Uh, and within that base model, the decisions I think are, is it exploitable? Like that was the exploitability and some of the options there are it's active or there's proof of concept code or none. 
You can go into the attack complexity the, or how automatable it is, the technical impact. And then I think mission being is the last based one. And it's based on those decisions that you're making within that tree, you get to an outcome that says whether or not I should act now, I should act like I should put this in my backlog, I should tr be tracking this, or I should just add this to my scheduled monthly patches or something like that. And so that's what the base model is. And the beauty about SSVC is that you can basically take that and iterate on it for your own purposes, your own organization. You can create your own decision trees based off what matters to you, what matters to your organization, what is what do you think are the riskiest things, and just mix and match based off of that those discussions, right? And so the other part of that is, okay, now that I've I've determined what I'm going to do with that, there's a sort of a missing piece of, okay, is there a patch available? Is there... Do I have to mitigate that? So those are some things that we can extend SSVC to do. But as of right now, that's not part of the base white paper or anything like that. What I found in 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 practice here is that we we need to find data that goes along with that. And so building off of CVSS and EPSS, okay, what thresholds of EPSS do I want to prioritize? Do I care about the CVSS score at all, or do I want to look at just the attack vector string? And I also need to contextualize my my decision tree with asset context and environment context that tells me like, okay, which assets are the most critical. So I need to basically codify your prioritization is what I'll say. So, yeah. So SSVC, it sounds like it's a framework, a tool that you can basically insert even metrics from these other systems into to correlate with, with the things that you personally care about. And then essentially say, okay, if this metric is over this number that I want to make this decision. And you work that into a, a flow and a process that, that makes sense for you. Yeah, essentially. Yes. Yeah. How hard is that to do from your experience? I've talked to a really, a lot of smart people and this isn't really fully operationalized anywhere from what I can understand, at least like in a scalable sense, it is a little bit difficult to get off the ground. You really need to be, be collecting that data. Uh, from both your environment and from things like the Kev, things like EPSS, things like commercial threat intelligence, just put those into your model. And then you need to also have conversations with your business leaders about, like, okay, here are the thresholds that I'm thinking, but you also need to be aligned with what the business tolerates from a risk perspective. I wouldn't say it's difficult to create. It's difficult to tune and operationalize at a large scale. So what I'm what I've been doing is trying to start small, right? You just say, "Hey, I want to make these two or three decisions and then you iterate from there." EPSS greater than like 10%, right? Let's prioritize that. Greater than 6, let's prioritize that. And then we can play around with that stuff to see what are it, it should align with your capacity as well. And that really gives you a lot of feedback to tune what your decision tree should look like and what your thresholds should look like. Yeah. And the last one that we didn't talk about here is, is Kev, which is basically, as I understand it, a catalog of published CVs that have evidence of active exploitations. Uh, so I, I do have a list here. So on our blog, on the Ender Labs blog, Varun wrote a blog about this a while ago, breaking down these exactly these four things. So essentially, if something is published as a CV, it has evidence of active exploitation, which they have a definition for what that means. And we have clear remediation guidance for it, then it is included in this catalog. So it's a binary one or a zero, either it is on there or it is not on there. So it is almost like it feels almost like this is the other side of the EPSS coin, right? This is not a probability of exploitation, but this is this is something that we have seen this out in the wild exploited. Darren, when you were running these programs at a large scale, what is, do you, how likely are you to trust something like this and to base your decisions off of this? I know you mentioned that Kev is not specifically something that uh, you had too much experience with, but that's exactly why I'm interested in asking you this question. Like you are now running a large vulnerability management program. How likely are you to trust this sort of binary one or zero it's on the list or not on the list type of metric it's a trustworthy input and it's one of those things where we tend to as an industry talk about things as i care and i don't care and that's just not realistic at scale because I, I care about a lot of things that i don't have time to actually do them all 
So things like Kava are really high value because I, I wish this said it existed the last time I built a program because it's like, yeah, if people are actually being exploited by this in the wild, I want to know about that. It doesn't mean automatically that it's some it's a concern for me, right? I have to do some research to find out because just because it's exploitable in the wild, it might not be exploitable in my system, right? I need to, I still need to figure that out. And you can't use a single signal. Everybody would love one. We'd all love the easy button that goes, hey, anything that's on this list, we have to fix and we have to do it in 30 days or whatever the case may be. And places like PCI and the various contractual and regulatory bodies really like to do that. Anybody who's been through FedRAMP knows you have a certain number of days, depending on your ILO level and a couple other things, to fix vulnerabilities. And it just doesn't, it doesn't scale. It doesn't work. It's expensive. It doesn't necessarily reduce risk in a way. It's really high value in terms of, I like to know if people are actually exploiting this in the real world. If I definitely do, that's definitely going to bump things up in, in my priority list. But it's not an automatic. There is no easy button. You can't look at any one of these things and go, if it's on the list, I need to deal with it. You have to be able to consume all of them, as well as internal context and temporal data. Hey, this thing is, is exploitable in my environment, but I'm using it for this one internal thing that doesn't have access to any sensitive data. It's probably not going to be really high on my priority list. If I'm using it over here in FedRAMP and it's accessible to the internet, it's probably going to go higher. That's something none of these scoring systems can tell me, right? That's something I have to figure out for myself as part of my program. Mm -hmm. So... Now that we have a bit of a ground base, we know these are four major metrics that are out there. One other one that is not necessarily a metric is, of course, reachability analysis, which is a, a big part of what we do at, at Endro Labs, figuring out if, okay, we found a risk, and that could be an operational risk or a security risk. Uh, is that risk actually reachable? Is it, am I actually using this specific piece of code that's invoking the vulnerable function. I'm actually using it. Is it in a test scope, which is, of course, another thing that we can layer on top of that. But what I'm interested in, by the way, we did a whole session about how program analysis and how reachability analysis work. Everybody who signed up for this session also immediately gets access to all of our past Lean AppSec sessions. You'll get an email from one of us with that session. What I'm interested in, and Stephen, it sounds like the, you're in the throes of doing this for the past, I don't know how long, you now have all this data. How does it work? Is it now up to you to figure out which of these data points can I actually use to prioritize risk in my organization? Where do you even start? If someone were to go on this process today and came to you and ask you, what are the first steps that I can take in my organization uh, to start implementing a program? Uh, what would your advice be? Uh, it would be looking at exploitation, right? Do we see act and own active exploitation like the Northwest or, or anything from your threat intelligence programs within your um, within your organization, right? Um, that, that are related to CVEs. And then also with EPSS, right? So if you bundle just the EPSS score and whether or not you're observing active exploitation or at least known exploitation in the past of these specific CVEs within your environment, then that's how you should start. Like it's been, I think there's definitely data to back that up and I don't have on hand right now, but I think the highest impact that you can have in your organization to prioritize CVEs is looking at that exploitation data. So looking at EPSS, looking at commercial threat intelligence related to, e to CVEs, and looking at the CAV handset. Darren, can you maybe talk a little bit about how does that look like in, in practice, right? So where in the software development lifecycle do you introduce all of this data? Is it right after code was committed? Is it while the code is on its way to be merged into production environments? Like where do we inject all of this data and go to Steven to say, hey, wait, whoa, stop everything. This it has a score of over this number. How, how does that work? I mean, it, it depends a little bit on where the maturity of your development organization and your security program are, right? Because I, I think people, I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of actually shifting left without shifting like accountability left, right? Just like help developers make better decisions early in the life cycle. So I think as an end goal, you wanna have this thing at every stage, right? You, you wanna have data about, hey, as close to when you've introduced risk as possible is the end state. That's often not realistic to do day one or even day 300, right? 
you, you have to grow and, and meet your development org and your, your security team's capabilities where they're at. If you have something like a very small security team, but you have a security champions program where you have security champions embedded in the developer organization, then you're going to want to look at things where you're closer to developers earlier on because you have those security advocates embedded who can make those decisions. And so I would put things in pipelines. I would put things in IDE plugins. I wouldn't force an IDE plugin on, on, on a developer. That's a great way to make angry developers. But if you make a good one available that can give them context and give them decision-making ability as they're developing, that's helpful, right? But really your points of control are going to be pipeline, pre-deploy, and then like real world monitoring. Because you can deploy something that's safe today and then you find out it has a problem three weeks from now, you need to be able to catch that. So where I usually yeah. tell people is to start on the right, right? Find the stuff where it is in production and make sure that you can find it and respond to it. And then start ticking back left as your organizational and, and AppSec maturity supports it. Yeah, and Darren, just to build off that, right? Location data is temporal in nature, right? It's like EPSS changes daily, as well as the the indicators that you may get from your threat intelligence program or even the Kev, right? And so it's important to have those monitoring points all across your deployment pipeline or your uh, integration pipeline, so that you catch it. it. It could be whenever, right? It doesn't have like you. You might have it in your all all the way left as far possible, but that's not going to matter if the exploitation data comes in, you know, two weeks later and and it's already deployed. It's it's just like to your point, Ron. Yes, it's really good to put that wherever, but it's just important to remember that like exploitation data is temporal and it, it's really important to have as much monitoring as, as possible within, within your pipeline. What is typically realistic to do though at uh, an organization, for example, the size of a uh, yeah. Peloton? And I know that Darren, you've, we've worked for some retailers and, and some large companies as well. I'm imagining that the way we ship software is, is pretty distributed and not necessarily like uniform to one specific process, right? Because at the top of the call, Stephen, you mentioned pipelines, plural, right? Like that, that yeah. you are implementing this in. Are you finding yourselves tailoring, monitoring at different stages to different pipelines in your organization? Or are you trying to create something like more, more central, if, if that makes sense? Yeah, so at least initially centralized, right? Because it, it's really hard to start differentiating if you don't have a good base of what of how you are actually ingesting and, and prioritizing this data right and my big stick is i think darren mentioned don't put stuff like don't put ID plugins like on, on their on those developer systems but um it's important to make developers aware of these things and so it, the visibility aspect of it is huge hey um we detected this after the fact it has this is why we think it's critical. It has EPS of like 90% or whatever. And this is our expected SLA for those sort, sorts of things. And you don't necessarily want to block this stuff because nothing really is going to be a blocker within vulnerability management, in my opinion, just because of that temporal aspect of it, just because things change all the time. You definitely want to just grant visibility as much as possible and communicate with your dev team or your engineering team to, to say, this is the expectation for when we detect this sort of signal and we'll work with you to either patch or mitigate that or grant an exception. Like it can't be just a, Hey, we detect this, fix it. No one wants to do that anymore so, or at all ever. Yeah. And po policy is one of the more powerful things you can do, but it is a maturity thing. So yeah. you always have to start with visibility. And I, I think people try to run too far ahead too quickly in a lot of cases. But it is a thing where the first problem you have is visibility. And then the second problem you have is you have too much visibility and you don't know how what to do with it. And yeah. so then you graduate to having a good workflow. Um, and then from there, you graduate to real governance and real focus. So you can actually have uh, policies in place that tell people at the time of you know, either making a mistake or making a decision that we'd like them to review or whatever, that you're, you're getting that information to them very quickly. And it's a thing we hear across our customers all the time. People want to break the build. And it's, we have to be very cautious about doing that. There is a time and a place, but you need a lot of maturity from an organizational and process standpoint before you're willing to stop something going into production. And you have to be very choosy about what those things are, right? They have to be high priority, high risk items where you're like, we definitely are willing to tank velocity and productivity in order to prevent this risk. Yeah, I think the only time that I would have considered breaking a build is probably the height of log for day, 
right? Like when that came out, when that was, everyone was, there's so much signal everywhere that says, this is horrible, right? And say, for instance, the next day it's in your pipeline about to be deployed. Yeah, no, that's not happening. But that's really like those, like and we didn't have SSVC back then, or at least in, not in its current form or EPSS in its current form. And it's really hard for me to like, look back and say what our decision would have been then, but, and I can only assume and make a, an opinion based on some of those factors. But in my opinion, that would have been like the only one where it's like a big break. How often do these decisions get made in terms of directing developer effort, right? So how often do we scan code that has not been deployed yet or code that is already deployed and we're monitoring to see if maybe there's a new exploitation out there and then going back to developers to say, okay, I need you to to fix this or at least let's have a conversation. On our last Lean App Sec, we had Stacey Hong, who's the SVP of engineering at, at Okta, and she used the term litigation for some of these meetings to try to understand what's critical, what's not critical. So how often does that cycle need to happen, in your opinion, Stephen, to be effective? Yeah, I'm going to go with as soon as there's an update with your data source, you should be rerunning that. So for instance, EPSS updates daily, right? I want to have the latest EPSS data that's that's available to me and run that temporal score through pipeline or my vulnerability identification pipeline to see if anything has moved up or down. And based on that movement, we can send out notifications like, hey, we, this just breached a threshold, right? Let's let's have a conversation or at least notify you like, hey, your SLA just changed based on new data that we just, that's affects the, the risk of, of a specific asset, right? So getting to that level of maturity is difficult, right? But if you, when you, if, and when you get there, the, the temporal faction, the fa temporal factor of risk is crucial to inject when, and when that data is available to you, right? Like I want EPSS data as soon as it comes out, which is a daily. And then anything that you get from your, your CTI vendors, your commercial threat intelligence vendors, how, how often that updates and stuff like that. And yeah, so I would say it just really depends on what your data sources are, but daily is probably good, at least for EPSS. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in a, a few more things here. Sorry. I'm just going through a list of, of questions that I wrote down here in advance. One thing that I'm, that we haven't really talked about that I'm very interested in is do you at all consider risks that are not CVs? Do you at all consider operational risk or things like maybe we sometimes talk about the more advanced supply chain attacks and things like typo squatting or things like that. Do those things that don't traditionally fall under the umbrella of CVEs enter your decision tree at all at this point? Or is that more of a, a future thing for you? So it's a future thing for me, but it's not, I am looking at it, right? Because there are things like cloud misconfigurations that can both affect your decisions in vulnerability management, but also other ways to like, you, you need to pre be able to prioritize those as well. And certainly tech debt or license issues can be prioritized based on risk, but it's really hard to quantify that out of the box. So it's really in my opinion, a little subjective. If you have something there to, to base your decisions off of, you can codify and define what those decisions are. There's value, right? Yeah. It, it's definitely something that I'm hoping to explore at least within a, a decision tree model, but not currently, right? It's really hard to do that without a, a defined standard and it's really easy to do that with CVEs because there's so much data on them. But yeah, there, it's definitely within the roadmap. Yeah. Darren, can you explain a little bit about, okay, we talked about some actual tangible stuff that you can do, start with exploitation, EPSS. Steven, I think you were even involved with the working group, right? For Yeah, uh, the SIG. Yeah, so for EPSS, so we can also talk a little bit about that. But Darren, can you explain a little bit, how does reachability information work into this at all? Like, how would you layer that on top of everything we talked about so far? Yeah, so this is a piece of the, and we talked a little bit about the need for context, right? All of these scoring systems, they're looking at it in, if you can think of it as like, 
a default standard organization. How bad would this be? How likely is it across the industry? That's super useful. That's information that I, as a practitioner inside an organization, can't really get any other way, realistically. But there's another layer of, okay, that, that helps me eliminate stuff I don't have to care about in a lot of ways, but it's still a big pool of things that are now like, okay, I've, I've narrowed my focus down. This is what affects people. What affects me? And doing that requires you to have context about your organization, where your applications are running, what's in them, right? So reachability is one of those kind of context factors. So I want to know things like, okay, is this an application that's accessible to the general public? You know, it's over, over the internet. That's going to be, vulnerabilities are going to be a higher risk there than authenticated known users only. But then I want to know, okay, I, I'm importing a, a package. I'm using an application that has vulnerabilities in it. The vulnerability is reported in it, but is there actually even a path for someone to exploit? And that's where reachability comes into play. And it's, it's one of the most powerful prioritization tools that you can have, in my opinion, is go down to, hey, I'm using this in my software. I'm using this component in my software. Am I using the part of it with the vulnerability or not? Is there a call yeah. path from what I wrote to the vulnerability? Because if there's not, it's not that there couldn't be someday. It's not like I don't have to care ever. But it's certainly not as big of a priority as if, no, there's definitely a path there. And if that path is exposed to the internet, I'm in big trouble, right? And getting those two pieces, you can't do that without doing some kind of call graph analysis and figuring out, can I get there from here? It's, I, I use this metaphor a lot with people helping to understand prioritization. It's thinking about the recall, right? If I have a set of screwdrivers and there's a recall, it says, hey, this number two Torx bit in your screwdriver set breaks when you do certain things with it. Right. So my first question is, do I have the screwdriver set? Because if I don't, why do I care? Right. And that's like the, that there's your dependency graph. This is a dependency exist in my environment. Secondly, am I using that bit? Because if I'm not going to send back my whole screwdriver set and be without it for two weeks or whatever the case may be over one bit that I never even use. And then the last piece of it is, am I using it in the way that's likely to cause me a problem? And that's a risk judgment, right? Yeah, sometimes I am. Do I care enough to go through the hassle of sending this back? Or am I just going to live with, with the risk or not? That's where the subjectivity enters into it. And so reachability kind of answer, answers that middle question. Am I using this part of this set? If I'm not, then I don't care about the CVE, right? Not right now. Again, it's temporal, right? So it can change. But like right now, not high on my priority list. And yeah, Darren, just to build off that, right? If you're putting that into SFCC in a decision tree, you can funnel your your the, the CVEs that you actually care about way down, right? Like it it could, in my opinion, be more meaningful than exploitation activity. But I don't have the data to back that up, right? But there, it's it the potential's there. I can see that it's reasonable to like think that it could be the most important factor, right? Like, am I actually using this function? If not, well, let's just track it. Like it, we, we see it, but it's just not on my to-do list anymore. It's, it's, hey, if it if something changes temporally about it, or if, if the if we start using it, then we care about it. And so, yeah, I find a, I would find a lot of value in that and adding it to your asset context when you, you're doing your decisions. And I think it's an essential part of the conversation if you're ever going to break a build, right? Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to break a build unless I can provide my developers evidence that this is actually exploitable. Right. Otherwise, one hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. You're working backwards is what you're doing. <laughs> right. Like you're wasting people's time if you don't have the right evidence to say, "Hey, this is why I think this should build. This should break the build." And we have pretty strong evidence to suggest that it's a very high risk organization. Right. But say, for instance, like with Log4J, that's not reachable. <laughs> like within your code, like then the priority goes way down, right? Even though it's prevalent and it's it was everywhere. But yeah, no, I see the value there. It's, yeah, you should be doing this. You can't mention this as a single important factor. I honestly think if you're really serious about prioritization, like that the mix of whether something is reachable and like the EPSS score of the CVE is I think dwarfs a lot of other things, right? The other things are still yeah. valuable and they're gonna be they're gonna be valuable to very specific use cases, right? So it's hard to make general statements about them. But what we see is people, if they use EPSS score alone, they're dropping their their report, they get a report of everything that's wrong in the organization and like 20% of it has an EPSS score above some reasonable threshold, right? 8% or yeah. 5% or whatever it is you're using. 
And that's really good. And then the same thing happens if you use like reachability. If, if you do like a context yeah. combo, I don't care about my test code because it's test code. It runs some tests. I can lock the machine down. And if I do that and reachability, I get about 75% reduction. But when you combine them, like I've seen people reduce their stuff by 98%. And they go, 98% yeah. of what's just reported to me goes in the I don't have to worry about it right now bucket. That's yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And if you do that, you don't have to do anything else because that's probably within your capacity to remediate, right? The you there's data out there that suggests it's between five and fifteen percent of most organizations, or sorry, you most organizations remediate between five and fifteen percent of their vulnerabilities. That's within your capacity, so you, you could stop, right? Like you could stop there if you wanted to. But yeah, it's yeah. Stephen, is your team, or do you think teams that are equivalent to yours? should be involved also way earlier in the process of selecting, for example, which open source packages are even uh, selected by developers to, to be used at all? Yeah, I've, I've gone back and forth about this. I've actually, this is a, this is a good question. Um, I don't know, right? I think it's worth having a conversation like, cause there is data that suggests like certain um, languages or libraries are more vulnerable than others. Um, but I mean, you're also, I mean, you also can't really restrict your devs to write a specific language, right? Because it doesn't really work that way. Like all code can be vulnerable, right? It, it's, it depends on how you're writing it, not necessarily on the language. So at most, maybe just knowing what your landscape is, like in that conversation, hey, here's some data. I don't know if it's going to make a, a, a decision or make a, an impact to what your decision is going to be about which way you go. But... I think it's definitely worth exploring and worth having a conversation with, with your partners. Yeah. Yeah. One of the interesting things that, uh, you know, when we were talking about doing this session and you, you mentioned using data-driven prioritization to make policies that are specific to your organization. And we talked a lot about, okay, what these policies look like in the software development lifecycle where you say, okay, an EPSS score of over this and things that I care about specifically and things have to be very bad, like on a global level for me to break a build. And I'm also wondering, is it realistic to have those sorts of policies in the selection process to say, okay, something that I know already has unfixed CVEs on it and doesn't have a lot of activities or something that is in an archived repository on GitHub. Like these yeah. are things that I can already tell, like this is not getting security fixes. Is it realistic to put in some sort of guardrails, not like a whitelist, but like guardrails that say, if things fall beyond these criteria that I've set of, about things that I already know that I care about, then I don't want you to use them. Or I want you to have them approved by like a director of engineering. Do either of you see that as a, as like a worthwhile process or does that put an, like another burden on developers that slows them down? So I don't think it's necessarily on developers. I think it would be more so on the security team, right? Or the, even the GRC team, right? So m my opinion is Yes, we can codify this in policy, right? And that we can have an exception process that would be approved by a, a director or something like that, or whatever level you want. But so like some of the metrics that you want to look at is how, like for open source projects, right? Like you said, are there regular releases? Are there, and, and what is the cadence of those releases? Are, is there a lot of community engagement? Are like how many contributions are happening? If this is like a widely used thing, it's a dual-edged sword, right? Yes, there's going to be fixes for it, but that's, but it's also everywhere. Right. So you gotta, it's like you've taken the good with the bad or at least the potential for bad, but the good news is you can know that front, right? Like you, it's a, it's not, it's a known unknown to you rather than an unknown, right? That this repository or this open source code is getting security fixes. But say for instance, something like logs J happens there. And I hate that I keep going back to that, but it's a really good example. And it get patched within 36 hours or something like that. But so now you know that, but you can also identify those repositories as having potential risks for things like that and track that much more. But yeah, I think there there is value there to maybe collaborate with your partners in engineering and dev to say, hey, we don't want to have repositories that are different, right? Or are like we we definitely want to have a threshold of engagement or at least of releases that's cut that are coming out of this. Yes. this repository that that we want to utilize. I think like recently 
like one of the ones that caught my eye was like JQ, right? JQ had been stale for a long time, but I know everybody uses it. Like it's it's such a such an important tool. And I think it recently just got picked back up. And I I don't know who by who off the top of my head, but it's that's a really good sign. Great. Like it makes everyone more comfortable that someone's looking at it now. But it's also speaks to the challenge of open source, right? Like you're relying on the community to maintain these tools that you're putting into your enterprise products. So it's definitely, these are a lot of things that you have to be aware of when you're selecting uh, tools for your environment. So. Yeah, and to kind of build on that, like it's, I think that there's a dream that a lot of AppSec people have of like, and make a rule. And then if everybody complies with the rule, our risk will go down. And it's just, it, software development's messy, right? It, it just inherently is. And if you ask a developer to wait multiple days before they can only use a library as a general case, like you, you're just going to have angry developers and you're not actually going to lower any meaningful risk in your organization by doing that. So I think where a lot of this kind of like being able to score things and use data driven like selection criteria is make it really easy to consume and give people like a risk profile rather than a yes, no decision. It's, hey, this is very low risk, go ahead. This is higher risk. You should really review it with your director of engineering and make sure that you're understanding the risks you're accepting here. This is really high risk. We need a VP, we need a CISO, we need a, somebody to sign off because, hey, this is unmaintained. It might still be very useful to us. It's an open source project. Are we gonna commit to vendoring it in and maintaining it if there's issues? Because if not, then as an engineering org, you're probably going to want to say no to this rather than us saying, oh, your score was below three. So no, right. It should be your score was below three. Here's why. Here's who needs to sign off on that to accept the risk if that's the way you want to go. Right. This is what it will take to use this safely. It's kind of I'm recapping some of the takeaways, some of the notes that I took while you guys were imparting wisdom was that. If you're not sure where to start with your prioritization kind of journey, then you start with exploitation. Like you start with, with EPSS, you start by understanding how likely is this to be exploited or was this exploited already? That seems to be like an obvious place to, to start. Darren, your advice was start in the right and work your way backwards through the process as you prioritize and also don't force ID plugins on developers and don't break builds unless like the world is ending, right? So things have to be very bad in order to you to actually sacrifice the productivity of the developers. Narrow and very bad. <laughs> is there anything else that you would give as advice to essentially most of the people listening to Lean AppSec or attending our academy or consuming any of these resources that we try to make them as useful as possible. These are mostly application security people or people getting into application security. I've just had a conversation with someone who was in NetSec and was basically handed your AppSec now, congratulations. And, and he was going to, he was attending our academy basically to learn what he needs to care about. So for those folks, is there any other pieces of advice that would you give specifically on prioritization or, or do you think that about covers it? I think the main thing that I would probably tell any AppSec person, especially if they don't have prior like AppSec or dev experience is go be open and learn from, from your developers, right? Like the, your organization has as part of its business delivering software, your job is to support that, not to block it, not to make it harder, not to, sometimes we have to, but we want to make it easier and faster for everybody we're on the same side and you can't effectively do your job until you understand how your development process works and what your development organization cares about what their risks are what's important to them yeah darren i couldn't say it better myself communication is key right and having that open line of communication between the people that you're supporting or the or your partners will solve a lot of those issues, right? Like it, that's the grease for, for the wheels of progress, right? You, you want to be able to have that open line of communication, talking to those partners as much as possible, <laughs> right? If you're, especially if you're new to this field and understanding where their pain points are, how you can help, that's a really good first step. It, even, and that's not a technical thing at all. That's a, a human thing, it's an empathy thing, go talk to them. Amazing. Steven and Mia, thank you so much for helping us out with this. Yeah. I've been I've been following some of your appearances on on podcasts and on some of these types of sessions. So I'm really excited that we got to do this together. And Darren, as always, thank you for participating. And we'll see you on the next Lean yeah. session. Bye, everybody.